base amplifier and BJT is very similar. So the difference between MOSFETs and amplifier, MOSFETs and BJT amplifiers is two things. One is the infinite inf impedance you have at the gate, which usually makes your life much easier. And the second thing is the dependence of GM on the square root of current instead of current itself, which uh, means that you normally get more GM out of the BJT for a given amount of current. Uh, but for a MOSFET, you also have the W2R ratio that you could play with. You know, we think it's you know, maybe a couple of thousand is reasonable, but if you, all of a sudden you want a million to one ratio, uh, that's not going to work. So, um, so, and that's that. That's really the end of the uh, individual basic devices for this course. I don't know what happened to my tablet. Let me try closing it and turning it back on. Oh, what? <laughs> it's like <okay. laughs> it. So today, uh, and then for the remainder of the course, we're going to talk about a new device. It's not a device, it's really a circuit that is made of all those components that you already have learned about. It's made of transistors especially, but diode transistors and everything else. And it's called an operational amplifier. I'm so sad. I went I'm to just the curious, in terms of uh, MOSFETs, will we be going over cascading MOSFETs at all or not? Cascading them how? So as in like you have one, one MOSFET here and another MOSFET here. I, don't I, don't mean, I can go through that for uh, a tutorial. Yeah. tutorial. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but you know, discrete circuit designs based on MOSFET are very uh, Unless you're talking about power electronics, we usually don't use MOSFETs. If you need a FET in a discrete circuit, you use a JFET, not a MOSFET. But it's a different type of device. Okay. It's still a squared relationship between current voltage, but it's a little bit different in terms of structure. Uh, but anyway, so we're going to talk about operational amplifiers. If you guys learn nothing so far about BJT's MOSFETs or diodes and you take away just this off-amp material from this course, it's going to help you in more than half the situations in the future, right? So, focus, focus, focus. <laughs> and it's not going to help your grade because it's only 25% of the material, <laughs> but in terms of what you can do or what you need to do in future, you can do most of it with off -amps. And it's much easier and straightforward than somebody else has already gone through the pain of designing many, many, many different off amps for different applications. So pay attention. Good news, these guys are super easy to use. Bad news, they're usually more expensive. But, you know, we're comparing a couple of dollars to just a couple of cents. So, really good device. So what is an op-amp? An op-amp is a circuit that has two terminals. At the input, and one terminal at the output. So let's call this one B plus, this one B minus, and this B out. Okay? And this is, um, there are different types of op-amps. We're talking about the most generic one that has voltage at the input, voltage at the output. There are some op-amps that take two currents at the input and produce a voltage at the output. There are also op-amps that have voltage at the input, current at the output. I haven't come across one that has current at the input, current at the output. But anyway, you can have that one too. But this is the most generic one. This is 95% of op-amps that we see out there. And for an op-amp, the relationship between the output voltage and input voltage is this. Okay? As simple as that. So, how does it do that? Well, there is a relatively complex circuit inside this. There is a bunch of transistor amplifiers and biaxin circuits and everything else inside it that make sure this relationship is helpful, right? And you normally use off amps as linear devices. If you look at that relationship, it's a linear relationship. A naught is a constant, it's your gain. And it's a linear relationship between the out and either one of the two inputs. 
how we maintain that linearity, we're going to talk about in a second. But this is really it, as simple as that. And you can notice that, okay, I can connect V minus the, we call that inverting terminal. So this is inverting input. And this one on top is obviously non-inverting. So when I talk about inverting the input of the off amp, it's V minus. When I talk about non-inverting, it's zero, V plus. Uh, and you can see that, for example, if I connect the inverting input to ground, I have V out equals A naught V plus. I already have an amplifier. A naught is usually a large positive number. And if I want an amplifier with a negative gain, I connect V plus to ground and apply the input to V minus. So that's as simple as that, right? So let's see. Uh, I have an example here. Let's just go through this example. We already can show that an op amp with this configuration can be useful. So let's say I have a situation like this. And I short circuit the input and output, the inverting input and output of the op amp to each other. And I want to find out the amp. OK? If this is an op amp, if it is in its linear range, uh, it should follow that relationship. So let's, let's see what happens if I connect the output and input like this. So in this case, V out, I know is going to be A naught times V plus minus V minus. Okay, this is the equation for the alpha. But looking at this circuit, because I'm shorting the input to the, in, uh, to the output, V minus, or the inverting input is again V out. Same, same term. So, And then V plus is equal to V in, in this circuit. V out is equal to A plus over 1 plus A plus. Okay. What's the point of having this circuit? Well, right away you can see that if my A naught is large, let's say 100, I have a buffer, I have a voltage you remember what we said about you know a meter follower or source follower? That sometimes you want to take a sample of voltage from somewhere and put it somewhere else. This can do that job if A naught is large. We don't know if A naught is large, but for a large enough A naught, this is about one. And because it's an amplifier, hopefully I will have more power at this end than what is available from that end. Right. Okay. So right away there is some application, but there is a lot. Let's talk about an idea law. So we didn't talk about ideal BJTs or ideal MOSFETs. You know, it, it, well, the equations we learned are for ideal devices anyway. They face in reality, they're not as nice. But uh, let's talk about an ideal op -amp. An ideal op -amp has these four characteristics. So let me just draw the up and up on the corner here. Two inputs, inverting and non-inverting, V out. Um, the characteristic is that V out is equal to some gain times V plus minus V minus. Okay? So characteristics of an ideal up and number one. A naught approaches infinity. Okay. So like before when we said you know a small signal, you could ask small compared to what? You can ask the same question here. You know, infinity means what? Is 10 and considered infinity or 100 or so? Real life applications, A naught is between 10,000 and 10 million. It's a large enough number. Right? It's a big number. For an ideal up amp, we assume it is infinite. Number two, 
you have, it's an amplifier. It's, it has two ports. You are going to assume that the input resistance, when you look into each one of these ports, is infinite. Right? So it's like the gate of a MOSFET. So you're going to assume that if I connect the source to each one of those two inputs, it sees an infinite input resistance. Or in other words, the, the way of saying it that is more practical, more useful in uh, life, is that you can say this I plus that goes into this terminal is zero, and the I minus that goes into this terminal is also zero. So zero input current. Or are the approaches in the Okay? So, so far, it looks like an interesting device. We already have infinite input resistance and a very large gate. The very large gate may not be what we want because we want a known gate, but we'll fit for Number three. It has zero output impedance or resistance. It's an ideal amplifier. Has zero output impedance, can drive any load you attach to the output. Obviously not sure, but that's the assumption. Zero output impedance. Okay, that's nice. And there's one last one, number four. Infinite speed, or what do I say here? Yeah, I say infinite speed. What are you saying? <laughs> okay, meaning that as soon as the change happens at the input, you see it at the output. Mm -hmm. There's no delay. There's no capacitances. There are no inductances that are between the input and output. There's nothing that has memory here. As soon as you see a change here, the output changes. Okay. So this one is probably the most questionable one, right? because you know, in reality, nothing has infinite speed. And we'll see that this is going to be a limitation when we talk about non-idealities of our lines. But the other three are actually, in reality, you're going to have a really, really hard time measuring the gain of an alpha, because it's so high. You know, a million is infinite for most practical applications. Because you want to gain a 5 or 10, right? Or, or 50, or 100, or 1,000. Still, a million is 1,000 times more. So that first one is usually we are not even bothered with it. It's high enough for most applications. Zero input current, yeah, in some cases you have to be concerned about it. So the input current for different op amps ranges from microamps to femtoamps. If a microamp is too much for you, go and buy an op amp that has a picoamp in it, input resistance. Input current. And if, if a microamp you cannot handle it, buy one that has a picoamp or one femtoamp of input resistance. So that second one is actually also very close to reality. And the output, the last one, the third one, is not really true under all conditions. A typical op amp has a couple of kilo ohms or a couple of hundreds of ohms of resistance at the output. If you use it open loop as is shown here, as soon as you use it in closed loop configuration, which we're going to talk about, that resistance drops to sub minimum. Right? So that third one holds when you use the op amp in linear applications. Okay? So the first one holds all the time. Second one holds most of the time. Third one, as long as the op amp is used in linear regime. Fourth one, we come back to that and then devise that. So, ideal op amp, so has these four conditions, has these four properties. Okay? So, again, infinite, zero input current means infinite input resistance. And, we, well, these op amps are real devices. You can just go and buy op amps. We're going to do that with op amps, right? And, and as I told you, there are transistors inside that are doing their job so that all these good things happen from the outside. What do transistors need? And power this is supply. the linear device. Hmm? Linear power supply. 
you need to bias them, right? You need to keep the transistors inside this guy happy so that uh, they do their job. But here's another good news. Somebody has taken care of the bias. Just apply power and this guy will be happily biased the way it should be. But you need to provide power. Right? So usually there are two more pins that you most of the time don't show, but you know they are there to provide power to this device. You know, plus or minus five, zero and five. You know, it can be single supply or dual supply. But you need to power up an output. It's not a passive device. It's an active device. There's a full bunch of transistors inside. Really, really old ones, they have about 10 transistors inside. New ones, 50 to 60, right? You need to keep all of them happy. But somebody has taken care of the biasing, just apply the bias voltage, 0 and 5, 0 and 2, plus and minus 3, whatever the, uh, your application provides, and then you can use it. And the biasing is taken care of internally. Okay? So, so far, easy. Let's look at one second to come up. So let me uh, connect the source to an, op -amp, an ideal op -amp, like this. I connect the non-invergent input to ground, connect the inverting input to a source as shown here and establish a feedback between the output and the inverting input using a second resistor. And the goal here is to find the output. Okay? I'm using an up amp, so I know that the out is a naught times B plus minus Um I missed one point here. Let let me come back to this example in one moment. I, I want to talk about one more issue about offense. So let's consider that op amp again, and let's assume in this case it is an ideal op amp with all those things that we just mentioned. Right? And because this is an ideal op amp, it follows that op amp, well, it is an op amp, so it follows the op amp rule. The out is equal to some A naught times B plus minus B minus. Okay? So that's, because it is an op amp, that should hold. But it's an ideal. So A naught goes to infinity. And let's see what that means. If this is a real circuit, the non amps are real circuits, V out cannot approach infinity. V out has a limit. So it's some voltage within the bonds of your power systems. So if I write this equation, if I go and write that first equation like this, so V out. Uh, or, or V plus minus V minus. If I write it as this, because V out is finite, 1 volt, 2 volt, 5 volt, 10 volts, then okay? A naught is infinite. What that tells you is that this ratio approaches 0. Okay? So what does that mean? It means that as long as you keep this op amp happy, as long as it is in its linear range, the two voltages on the two terminals are going to follow each other. Whatever you put on V plus, you're going to see on V minus. Whatever voltage you apply to the inverting input, 
you see the same voltage mirrored on the non-inverting input and vice versa. The two voltages track each other. And then we're going to see that in the second. You know, the second I'm showing you here in the, at the bottom, we'll demonstrate it right away. But the two track each other. Okay? So you may ask what happens if I apply two voltages, two different values to the two inputs. And the answer is that because of that high gain, you're going to push the up and out of its linear range. So let's say if you're using plus or minus 10 volts for supply, V out has to be between plus or minus 10. So if you apply, let's say, with the gain of a million, if you apply 0.1 volts to one input and zero to the other, the output wants to be 10 to the 5 volts. It's beyond the bond that we provide. You know, the upper bound is 10 volts. The up and repeat that limit. It's going to be non-linear. So it's not in that linear range that everything at nice applies to it anymore. As long as the op amp is in its linear range, this holds. Okay? So, so that's nice. So as long as the op amp is kept in its linear range, this holds. And you know you change V plus and V minus follows that. Right away, that's really interesting. It's like I have a short circuit between the two. Right? If I work, if I change V plus, V minus is changing and following that. What's the difference between this and a short circuit? No current is going between, right? So, so the two voltages are the same, but there is no current going between them. So that's very, very important. Keep that in mind. So for that reason, this is called the virtual short. It's not a real short. It's a virtual short, right? It's like data science. <laughs> Sometimes people show it as a dashed line between the two. They don't connect them. I, I don't want to even do that. Right? Just keep in mind, the two voltages are going to track each other. It's not a short circuit. The two sides of the circuit are still separated from each other and are not affected by each other. Okay, so so let's keep that in mind and now go back to the problem we had here. So that's my up amp. Yes? Does that mean that the output that I guess the port that's following the other one that acts as a voltage source? No, but yes and no. Depends on how you connect your circuit because This circuit, I connect V plus to an A minus, if, e, if A naught is infinite, the two voltages are equal. Okay? So if you connect something here, what happens? Well, the current, it, it acts as a voltage source, not because it's connected to this, but because it's connected to the output. If you need current, it comes from the output. Right? The voltage is forced to be equal here. But if you need current, if you attach something here, the current will come from the output, not from this end. This end takes zero or provides zero current. Okay? But the circuit I'll show you later, yeah, that even that doesn't work. So it depends on the circuit. Wait, I don't understand. So you get current at V out, but yeah. it goes back into the terminal where there's not supposed to be current? So if I connect, uh, where is the circuit? If I connect the resistor here, right? The current that this resistor needs come from the output port, right? But the output port is our short circuit at zero current comes or goes into this port, right? Okay. Let's go back to our example now. Oh, okay. So, um, I have that relationship. Yes. Just back to the one we were just on. So there's a current. Going through that lower circuit, yeah. which sets your V out at a non zero voltage. Well, whatever V in is. Because V out is equal to V. Oh, right, because of, yeah. Okay. Okay, so, um, so it's an op amp, so that's the relationship between the input and output, but it's an idea of op amp. If A naught goes to infinity, just because of the stuff we said in the above, V plus is going to be more or less equal to V minus. Okay? Thank you. 
Dr. Peter? <laughs> Teach us all poems. <laughs> What that means is that because of the virtual short that I have here, this voltage is also zero. So V minus, because V plus is equal to zero, I get V minus that is equal to zero. Okay? And if I want to find V out now, life is easy. Because I can calculate the current through R1. This current. I want to start it. Okay. And good news, it's an ideal op amp. So I'm in here, this I minus is zero. So of that current that comes in towards the op amp, all of it is routed through R2 and goes to the op amp. All the current that is flowing here goes through R2 and shows up at the output. And because I, let's say minus is zero, this means that I2, the current through R2, is equal to I1. And I also see that V out is minus I2 R2, right? Why minus I2 R2? Because again, the voltage drop, look at the direction of the current. The voltage drop across R2 is I2 R2. I'm fixing this and to ground to that one is minus I2 R2, right? So that's that. And I, I'm done basically, right? I2 and I1 are equal. The value of I1 is this much. That's the relationship to be in and I'm done. choose 1 ohm and 2 ohm, right? Can we say that R1 and R2 are in series then? They are not in series, right? But, okay, so the, they see the same current, but they are not in series. Because for two resistors to be in series, that middle node has to float. Uh, I'm forcing the voltage on that middle node to be zero. Oh, to zero, okay. Right? I'm forcing it. Using the op amp here, that's the job of my op amp. It's forcing that middle node to be at zero volts. Zero volts, not ground. Not ground. Right? Zero volts. It's not grounded. It's zero volts. They have a name for that too. They call it a virtual ground. It's not a real ground. It's a virtual ground. If you replace R2 with a potentiometer, can you have a variable gain? As easy as that. Wow. Or change R1 with a variable gain. Yeah, with a variable R1. resistance. R1. Right? R1 or save your money. Use buy one potentiometer because the potentiometer has three terminals. Yeah. One to the output, one to the input, middle, one to in between. Yeah. And you have your variable gain. The problem with that approach is that you have a nonlinear gain, right? Because it's the, the sum of the two is constant, but then. Anyway. 
Yeah, is that how my analog speaker works? Like if I turn it, because the guest tools is also on a um, exponential scale, is that uh, how it works? For potentiometers, depending on how they make them, they can make it to be linearly proportional to the angle, the value of the resistor, or they can make it logarithmic, or they can make it quadratic, they can make all of those things, right? Uh, depending on how old your amplifier is, if it is really old, it may have one of those special potentiometers. If it is new, uh, those are not cheap. So you may want to use a linear potentiometer and use a nonlinear transformer somewhere. Nonlinear transformer of resistance, not not the transformer. Right? So transform that into some value, of some nonlinear value. So can I just make a speaker amp with a single one? You're going to do that in the last lab, right? Yeah, right. So last lab, you're going to use an op amp plus a little bit more yeah. to make a, an audio amplifier, oh. and that's a two dollar audio amplifier. But it's going to be as good as a two dollar <laughs> But it's very easy to make. It's super easy. To make. Now, no. just hold on a second. So, no, I, I already love this guy. It has, it gives me any gain. Well, it's negative, but more than one or even less than one if I want to. Right? It gives me zero output impedance. In theory, this can drive any load. I don't have to worry about. You know, if I'm attaching a 100 ohm load to this, or a kilo ohm load to this, or an 8 ohm load to this. In theory, this doesn't care. My source here may be super weak. It could be a tiny microphone. The op amp provides all the power that you need to drive the speaker. That's great. What about the input resistance? What is the input resistance? <laughs> So what about the input resistance of this guy? Tell me how much it is. No, 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 no. It's R one plus R two. The input resistance is what my source is. When it looks to towards this R one in parallel to infinity. No, it's not even straight. This is R. That's the input resistance. How much is it? Oh, it's R1. It's just R1. Why is it R1? Because when you're going straight to the virtual ground. Would it be R1 in series with your load? Oh, yeah. Zero ohm is terrible input resistance for the voltage source. Yeah. Voltage amplifier. Shorting the source. It's not R1. What is V in over I in? This is I in, V in over I in is just R1. Right? Your source is sending some current into this amplifier. It doesn't know if the current went to ground or went around the oven. It, it wouldn't know. It, it, it has no way of knowing. Right? It just loses I1 amount of current. So the input resistance is R1. So this is something that I may or may not like, depending on the situation. If you want to have a one gigaohm input resistance, I don't like this. Because I have to use one gigaohm resistor over there, and I probably am not going to get any gain out of this thing. Because then I have to use, for a gain of 10, I have to use a 10 gigaohm resistor up here. Those kinds of resistances are not easy to handle. But if I want a precise one kilohm resistance for my input, I get it. Just put one kilohm here and choose R2 to get whatever gain you want, right? So it gives you flexibility to choose whatever, to, to have whatever input resistance you want. Unless you want something to super high. If you want a super high input resistance, then this guy may not be the best choice. So my, this, 
this triangle that you found, it's like kind of like a black box. Yes. Yeah, oh, right. Like what's inside? How does that? Mm. Do you want to see now? Or can you wait until the last one? Can I just plug? It's not a spoiler. Yeah, I said, yeah, I'm going to I'm really tempted to do this. Oh, there you go. I think that's a fake way to go. It's too cheap like that. I'd probably be a bit fat Yeah. There's not five. Are you walking here? Oh, you're right. No, no. But I just mean like the yeah, engineering test style. Like you did Lego Lego, right? I haven't done Something like this is from pages and it's not as simple as that. I've done it. Yeah. This is really awful, you know, you know, but it's a little bit more. At the, actually, this is, I like this one. At the core, you can reduce what you have inside an offer to something like this. A lot of it. You have an input stage that does the subtraction of the two signals for you. A gain stage that gives you whatever, you know, that large number that you want. So you get a gain of, let's say, 100 or so, 100 to 1,000 from the first one. This second one gives you a gain of more than 1,000, usually. And then you have a third stage that gives you the output resistance that is small. So in, in, if you look at a few of them, you should be able to see this pattern is repeating here. Yeah. The device seems to get to be true. Does it use a lot of power or anything? Again, depends on the application. Usually. If you're talking about the same generation of devices, right? So let's say devices from 90s, devices from 2000s, devices from 60s. You trade power for something, right? So, so you may have a lower noise device, but you have to pay the price of power. It's, it's the current, you know, it's that GM thing that affects everything. But as a general rule of thumb, for most of your typical applications, newer op-amps consume less power. Unless you go for something specific, if you want something wideband or low noise, then they consume a good amount of power. Good amount is how much? Like you may have five or ten milliamps of current from the power supply to bias. Well, not this to bias. These are all. Oh my God. This is a seven forty one. This is the amp we used in, in the lab. So again, at the input, it's not as easy to see as the first one, but this is your differential pair, this is your high gain stage, and that's your output stage. All those transistors are either trying to bias your devices properly, or trying to uh, avoid damage due to short circuits at the output, things like that. Right? So they are not all, the, all of them are amplifying the signal, some of them are for protection. But um, you can reduce this to what I showed you earlier. So this, this is the generic input switch. Or you can do it with MOSFETs, right? So you can have two MOSFETs like that at the input, a uh, second gain stage, which is common emitter or common source based normally. For high gain, you want a lot of gain. And the last stage that is usually a common drain or common collector stage. Do you generally do these other MOSFETs or new ones are MOSFET based, old ones are BJT based. There was a transition period in the 80s. 90s that you had mixed of both. MOSFETs give you a lot of input resistance, but they suck in terms of noise and bandwidth. So even now, today, so a lot of modern op-amps are MOSFET op-amps, but they don't make them your digital CMOS processes. They have special analog CMOS processes to make sure that the noise is lowered. You don't need seven nanometer for this kind of stuff. Uh, an old 90 nanometer is more than enough, maybe even 0.18 micron. Uh, so modern MOSFETs are mostly CMOS, just because the foundries are mostly CMOS nowadays. But speech, uh, even today, if you want to have the highest performance devices, usually uh, they are either BJT based or they are a JFET input type of a device. So JFET input can have BJT afterwards, or it can still have CMOS afterwards. But pure CMOS usually doesn't give you the best performance in any metric other than input resistance. But anyway, so this is, we will we'll talk about the history of these devices in the last lecture. And we have only five minutes to do another circuit. Another circuit. So, 
We like this amplifier. Your choice of input resistance, zero output resistance, whatever gain you want. Okay? This is called an inverting amplifier. And the, the name is obvious because your gain is negative. Right? It's an inverting amplifier. We also have a non inverting amplifier for those who are allergic to a negative sign. That's zero now. Yeah. And notice that I'm not drawing the power supply contacts, but they're always there. You need to bias whatever second you saw before has to be biased. Those transistors have to be in their active regions. Yeah, here. Here. Yeah, maybe you're wrong. I'll give you Oh, maybe you're right. You don't worry about it. Okay. So let me help. Actually, we have maybe 10 more minutes. Oh, it's not really exactly two more questions. So we have enough time. Because we didn't move the quiz, remember? Um, okay. So, so help me solve this. Same principle as the last one, right? So let's assume that ideal op amp and ideal op amp groups apply. So B plus equals to B minus, and I gain, I plus, uh, and I minus are. Good. Those are the two rules that we need, right? So the, the speed thing and the output resistance. Yeah, output resistance is positive. So what do I do? There's no oh, current. Yeah. Oh, shit, I'm really wrong. Okay. <laughs> because because um, there's no current for I minus. That means the voltage at um, the negative is zero, which means the in is also zero. Huh. Okay. Yeah. But so is this just the same thing as the last one? You just turn no. like you just. It's stop. similar, but it's not the same thing. The difference is that the last one I have my source yeah. here. And that terminal grounder, now I have my source here and this end ground. Yeah. Right? So it's not the same, but tell me what happens. How do I analyze this? Well, if D in uh, is, we can see it should be equal to D plus, mm -hmm. which should be equal to D minus, mm -hmm. right? Which means, I mean, that's where it starts. Which equals to D minus. Yeah, that's nice. That's okay, so that for right. if everything is <laughs> so what was discussed, should be the case. So this is yeah. the beginning of yeah. the Two, yeah, we call it V in plus R2, R2. Oh, R2 is okay. So I want it was V in over R, that's obvious. I have the voltage at this end of the resistor, I can find the current to it. I2 equals I1, I'm using that law for the ideal law. Because there is no current going into this terminal, this current and this current are equal. And if that's the case, then I know I2, R2. So V out is going to be the voltage I have here plus I to R2. Right? So V out is going to be V in plus I to R2. I2 is equal to R2. I2 is equal to I1, I1 is V in over R1. The last one, we said it was Oh, it has to be Where? I thought we had the 22 resistors. We said it was zero. It's connected to zero. 
So if you want a positive gain, here is the circuitry. Again, you can get any gain larger than one. There is a limit. This guy doesn't give you any gain you want. It gives you any gain you want that is larger than one. The minimum gain is one. Which is fine. Usually you want some gain or you want to just copy a voltage. If you want to copy a voltage, make this ratio zero. How do you make it zero? Set R2 to zero or set R1 to infinity, open R1. Or do both, just short circuit the output to this. Right? So that's what we saw in the first example. But if you want a positive gain, this is the circuit for you. And zero output impedance, that's a nice thing. So that's taken care of. What about the input impedance? What about the input resistance? Let me change it. That's a thing. So what is R is? Infinity. This is a virtual graph. Because this I plus is zero. Right? So great. This op amp does, or this circuit does, almost anything you ever want. With the exception of having to deal with the positive gain that is larger, always larger than one, it does everything else. It gives you infinite input impedance, zero output impedance, and then any gain you want. What if I want a one kilo ohm input gain, input resistance, or one mega ohm input resistance? What is, you know, so if you look at the uh, for example, your multi if it is a good multimeter, but if you look at your multimeter specs or your oscilloscope specs, they give you the impedance of that port, right? They tell you it's 10 megaohms or 1 megaohms. It cannot be infinite because sometimes you count on that being 10 megaohms when you're doing the measurement. It cannot be a random value. It cannot be 10 megaohms or higher. It has to be 10 megaohms, right? So in a situation like that, how do you get the resistance, the input resistance that you want? You put a resistor in parallel yeah. with your... Resistance. Exactly. So if, if you don't want infinite, if you want some R not value, put that resistor there. Right? And now your source sees the resistance that it likes to see, and you know, the rest of the story is as important. So, these two circuits, this one and this one, are your friends for life. These are super easy to use. Almost any off amp you pick off the shelf nowadays, you can make these circuits with them. Most of the off amps nowadays, you know, those that are a little bit tricky to use have essentially gone extinct. Uh, so everything that, almost everything you pick off the shelf from DigiKey, you can make these two circuits with it. Why do you choose different op-amps? I'll tell, tell, tell you that in a moment, but uh, these two circuits can do the trick for you. Yeah, so our R outs though, for each of them, what do we know about our R outs? R out will be zero. For both of them? For both of them. Interesting. So, <laughs> so when can I use these devices? See, the extent that you have to have those ideal off hand rules that gain is infinite, input current is zero, infinite speed, all of that. To have those things, especially this one, for this law, for this rule to apply, your device must be in its linear way. It must behave linearly. Okay? What does that mean? It means that if the input changes by some amount, the output changes by a multiple of that amount, right? How do you enforce linear operations? So far, you don't see it. How do I make sure this is linear? With op-amp circuits, 
you make sure the aircraft is behaving in its linear range by having negative feedback from the output to your source. You must always, always, always have negative feedback from the output of your circuit to where the source is attached to your circuit. If I connect that R2, if I switch the terminals of this aircraft, so let, let's see what negative feedback means. Let's look at the first circuit. This is ideal. In reality, you don't have infinite gain, right? So in reality, V plus and V minus will be different from each other by microvolts or nanovolts. And they are going to be a little bit different from each other. Okay. So let's see what happens when V in goes up. If V in goes up, Because your input resistance is not infinite either. You have some huge resistance here, maybe a giga, maybe a few gigaohms, but it's not infinite. If V in goes up, you expect that V minus to go up as well. By nanovolts. Okay? But if I pull the voltage on this side of the resistor up, I'm going to pull the other side up as well. Okay? So if that goes up, then V out, which is some very, very large gain, but not infinite. V plus is zero, so I'm just going to write it as zero. Minus V minus will go down, right? Because V minus is going up, it's a negative gain now. V out will go down. If V out goes down, OK. So you're pulling the voltage at the R2 end down. You're pulling that down. It's going to push V minus down again. So did you follow? So your source is trying to make a change in your circuit in one way. Your circuit comes and resists. It wants to push it back the way it was. OK? So that's negative feedback. Connect it the other way. Put the non-inverting input at the top, the inverting input at the bottom, and you'll see this goes out of that. Okay? I'll show you that in a second. But did you follow that? How, how we made sure that we have negative feedback here? Sometimes it's not that obvious. In here, it is very obvious, actually, because usually, especially if there's not a complex network between the output and input, we just try to find a connection between the inverting input and the output. Okay? And if there is no connection between the non-inverting input and the output, you're safe in most cases. But sometimes it's not that easy. You want to track the signal. Let's do that for the bottom one. Over here, let's say V in goes up. It's pushing my circuit. You know, it's, it's happy where it is. But V in is now moving in a direction that was uh, Cause some changes. So V in goes up, V plus will go up. V plus is shorter to V in. If V plus goes up, the upper is going to respond to it, right? We said infinite speed, but it's not infinite speed. So V out, which is So if, if you had a happy circuit before, now V plus is going to If V plus goes up, V out is going to go up, right? Because this guy hasn't changed much, right? We're moving faster than speed of light in this case. So V out will go up, right? If V plus goes up, V out will go up. If V out goes up, you right away see that you're pulling up the voltage at the end of R2. The voltage in between them should go up as well. So V minus will go up. And if V minus go up, if V minus goes up, because of that same relationship, you're going to pull V out down again. Okay? So when you're tracking feedback, what you want to do is that you want to start from where your signal comes and track the signal. Go through the chain 
And then if you have feedback network, go back to the feedback network back to maybe sometimes you have to go back to the source, but sometimes you go close to the source. But you want to show that a change caused by your input in one direction is opposed by your circuit. So a change caused by your input here wanted to push V out up, the circuit goes and pushes V out down. So this tells you negative feedback. Your input wanted to do this, but your circuit pushes it like this, okay? In the other one, V in went up, V the inverting input responded to it, but your circuit pulled it back. So this is to tell you that the, gain, the, next, the feedback is negative. If you switch the terminals of the up up in either one of those situations, you have positive feedback. Let, let's just do that quickly at the end of this session. Uh, so, <coughs> let's say, I don't know enough, let's say, or I miss the things when I'm making connections on my bread. So in this circuit, V in goes up. This is V in. It's going to pull V plus up. It's going to push V plus up. If V plus goes up because it's an off amp, And V minus hasn't changed, it's on a, actually it's grounded, so V minus will not change anyway. If V plus goes up, V out will go up. And if V out goes up, uh, you're pulling up the other side of R2, this other side of it will also increase, go up, so V plus will go up. And that's a disaster. You see what happens. Your input won't, so even if, your circuit was super happy before you touched it. Noise comes in. Noise comes in, pushes your V plus by the tiniest amount up. Your up amp goes and makes sure that you end up blowing your output, right? So whatever it is, you're gonna hit. And then after that, if V plus goes up, you go back to this loop. Keeps increasing, increasing, increasing until you hit the power supply limit, right? Your 10 volt pump, your 15 volt pump, three volt pump, whatever it is. There's no stopping it, right? So nothing is going to keep a bump in it. So you want to make sure your op amp has negative feedback around it, otherwise it doesn't follow those nice rules that we talked about before. The only one that you may still somewhat be hopeful that applies is that the input current is zero. But the other ones are out of uh, picture. So you don't have a gain anymore because it's not linear. There's no linear dependence between input and output. Output resistance doesn't have a meaning anymore because it's a non-linear device. And speed, actually op amp that is saturated, we call it saturated, right? Okay? So if you look at the V and V out relationship for an op amp, it looks like this. So you have some gain that you establish using the R1 and R2, so this is a non-inverting device, so positive gain, but this relationship holds until you hit a limit. Let's say this is your VEE and this is your VCC. So you have a linear range for your input. You know, if you push your input beyond that range, you're gonna push the up and beyond what you're providing it as power supply. Within that range, everything is nice and linear. If your input goes beyond, then your up amp is thought to be saturated. It, it doesn't respond to your input anymore. It's non-linear, and actually it becomes slow. So once it is saturated, it takes time for it to come out of saturation. Time in milliseconds, but that's usually a lot of time. So basically, uh, it will only prove linear if you provide it with the requisite power in whatever region you want. And negative feedback. And negative. Negative feedback is the important. So negative feedback makes sure you get this nice linear slope here, and you still have a range, right? So let's say if you have a 
an amplifier with a gain of 10, and your power supply is 10 volts, well, an input of 2 volts should get you a 20 volt output, but you cannot get a 20 volt output, right? So it's going to be saturated. You're going to be here, right? So you can have a range for the input, but within that range, you must have negative feedback. So negative feedback is the most important thing. And because A0 is, I have a little bit of bad news. Uh, if you thought that, you know, I go and buy an off amp off the shelf that has a gain of a million, and I use that in, as an amplifier with the gain of a million, you can't do that for a very short amount of time. Because usually noise and everything else is gonna mess up your life. You don't want, it's, so when you look at the data sheet, they say the gain is at least one million. At least 10 million. It may be 20 million, right? It may be one and a half million. You don't like that. Usually as a circuit designer, you want to know what gain you're getting. I want a thousand, I want two thousand. If you want a gain of a million, make two amplifiers each with a gain of a thousand and put them in series, right? So, so we don't use, almost never, use op amps in an open loop configuration. It is always a closed loop configuration. And that closed loop establishes negative feedback. All right, okay. That's it for today. Um, I'm gonna uh, stay here for the tutorial, but uh, that's the lecture. So the tutorial is about MOSFETs. No, the TA, you know, I asked him, uh, he, he couldn't do it this week. He's gonna do it by Tuesday. <laughs> No. I want to spend my money. The concept of zero voltage is like kind of weird to me. Virtual zero. What does that like mean though? Like, so physically, like after a while you're here. Virtual voltage. Yeah. Virtual voltage? Yeah, because you're saying the voltage virtual voltage like here is zero. Right? Yeah, because the this voltage is like the same as this voltage. Now that doesn't mean they're the same node, that just means that they're the same like node. So there's no potential difference between them. Yeah, but you can't pass current through that. Because it doesn't make sense, you can't have a good flow. So this, this one to cheer is going to be different than that one down there. What is, what is, what is, what is We're just wondering like why you can't just do the, like, like this. Well, yeah, why doesn't it flow through? Why not? Uh, no, it's just like sitting in the place. Oh, we're going to yeah, yeah. Because so, this voltage here yeah. is affected so, 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 by now. What do you mean so I can't. Uh, oh, is it because there's two? Hey, hey, maybe you buy Lego. Huh? You should go buy Lego. I'm buying Lego. If either it will fly, the big Lego. Lego. Yeah. Yeah. This one? Shit. Or will it be this one? <laughs> but this is affected by that. Yeah. 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 So yeah. to me, the what? The top end is actually really cool. Yeah. That's not the if it's at a higher voltage, no, that's the this one. I know, but I want, I want this. No, get the paper. Uh, yes, I want this. But this doesn't care. It's because I'm lower voltage. I want to pay you know, like, 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 That's why our game is negative. Yeah. I was like, what the heck is this question? That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Anyways, you got 10 for it. But this one, this one is positive. This one is different. I want to buy it. Of course. Yeah, actually, do that. What? Which one? 
I didn't realize that was like, 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 I don't know, like, <laughs> I don't use Facebook. All I do is Marketplace. I'm a Marketplace. My Marketplace is just like, yeah, I think that's how it works. Like, yes. Yes, but like, no. We'll be on our VN. I was joking about this. Because what am I doing across here? I was looking at Mark. What's going on? What the fuck is this? Wink, wink. But it's okay. Because if this is negative one, I'll be able to just check your address. Right, but I'm negative one here. Why not get some positive one here? Five EV3 can exactly don't have this. Or if you're saying that this gets burned up in three different ways. EV3 double marks. EV3 double marks. An EV3 can 700? Easily. It's because they're out, they don't sell them. You don't sell them. You don't sell them. Wait, actually? Like, mine's still. Okay, it has to be EV3 specifically. You can't do it anymore. Oh, 1.7 EV3 can 700. Oh, that's good. My my EV3 is like fucking like 150 or something. Yeah. What did you buy? An EV3? Or maybe 200? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe 200. Okay, maybe 200. Somehow it's not this expensive. Holy fuck. No, it's not. Yeah, it's zero. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I still do you think I'm going to Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's uh, okay. So why I'm, I still don't understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't understand why can't I just treat this as a series? Because no story can really go straight through. I know, right? Yeah. Like no story. So I can do this. I zero. I know. So zero. Because the answer is not. Right. So there's no voices right there. Which means, oh, I can do this. Open circuit. There's nothing right there. So is this just not one straight line? Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's just one straight line. So we know that, okay, we definitely know we have voltage here. Yeah. We have some current here. So we know there's definitely current though. Yeah. So make it just, let's just figure it out one millivolt. Or one, one milliamp. Yeah. And then here we know there's definitely no current here. No current. One milliamp. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry, Tim. Yeah, I know, but like, he's also. I guess that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, uh, this is yes, I'm currently going through here. R1 plus R2. Yes, yes that's, that's what I was saying too. I was like, okay, wait, why, why, why isn't it like V over I1 plus R2? Oh, yeah.